Welcome everyone back um, from your lunch break. I hope you had a good time also networking um, with the other attendees in our web app. Um, now we have a quite um, cool session, I would say. We have a fireside chat um, to wake everyone up. Um, we have two highlights here. Um, um, we have Quentin Vaquette from NG Asia Pacific, uh, Factory Asia Pacific. Um, he's, um, he's there in a quite, I um, think, innovative position. Um, so he's responsible for the venture activities across the region. And um, before he was also um, um, in other positions um, around energy tech business development and finance. And today he's here with um, Jason Tang. He's CEO and founder of Table Pointer. Um, it's an energy tech venture um, that helps yeah, sustainability of energy intensive um, commercial outlets. And um, Jason was before with uh, Man und Hummel, um, SVP for new businesses and IoT innovation in Asia Pacific. And now both of them are yeah, working together um, and they will tell us more about um, that yeah, collaboration in their five <laughs> So the virtual stage is yours. Great, thank you, Andrea. And, and hi, uh, hi everyone. Really, um, really happy to be here today um, with you all uh, to talk about an exciting subject. So, um, so what we thought to do for today was was um, was to have a bit of a, of a conversation around the the idea of building businesses in in the IoT space. And what it means in terms of, of business models, technology, customers, partners, and so on. Um, maybe I'll just take a quick second to, to, to introduce myself and, and allow Jason to do the same. Uh, and then we'll ask Jason maybe just to talk a little bit about uh, the company that he's, that he's been, that he started uh, before we jump into, uh, into an actual discussion. So on myself, um, I'm, I'm somebody who spent my whole career in the energy space. Uh, and I've sort of gone through the different uh, places in terms of uh, project financing, business development. I've started new companies in this space for NG. And, uh, and, and I started NG Factory about two and a half years ago, which is our venture fund for Asia Pacific. So IoT in the energy space is, is a very important uh, enabler for change because it sort of allows us to digitize a physical space uh, and, and, and as a result, essentially creates a quite significant amount of energy savings. Jason and myself actually know each other quite well. Uh, we work together, uh, maybe not on a daily to day basis, but, but at least on a week to week basis. Um, so I'm very pleased to be here with, with him today. Um, Jason, would you mind uh, taking a second to introduce yourself? Yes, uh, hi everybody. So I'm Jason and uh, right now I'm the CEO and founder of a new energy tech company called uh, Table Pointer. So the, allow me a few minutes to share with you um, what Table Pointer is, what do we do? And uh, I think this will be a really useful session for us um, if after this presentation that you may see opportunities for us to partner together. So we will be very happy if you were to reach out to us. So give me a couple of seconds while I share my screen. Oh, so just to help me to check, uh, Q, are you able to see my screen? Great. Thanks so much. So um, we are Table Pointer. We are helping the uh, commercial facilities, especially in the food and beverage space, to be better by transforming their equipment into energy-saving smart machines. Now, if you ever had a chance to walk into um, the kitchen of an F&B restaurant, a pub um, or a cafeteria, you will see pictures like this. And what do many, many of the F&B operators uh, have in common? Uh, you will see that their equipment is always on at a maximum settings from the time that they open the kitchen to the time that they close the kitchen. Uh, you will see them sticking pieces of paper here and there, um, telling the people, do not switch this on, do not switch this off, so they have very little data on their equipment. And uh, last but not least, imagine every single one of these restaurants like a mini factory 
So they have uh, many procedures, they have many people, they have many standard operating processes, SOPs. And to make things worse, they have to use uh, multiple equipment with many brands. And you can imagine that if you were them, any upgrades of the equipment would be very difficult and the return on investments are really uncertain. So this is really, really tough for them. And on average, they are losing 15% of their profits in energy waste stages. Now, so uh, I hope you forgive the, the pun for me to use this word here, but this is really an essential need. Every restaurant out there is using four times more energy per square meter than an office building. Uh, so if this is just one restaurant compared to one big office building, this is okay, right? But now if you imagine the restaurants out there all across Asia Pacific, and Asia Pacific is the largest and fastest growing F&B market in the world. So it is estimated that they are spending almost 60 billion per year just on energy spend. So what does Stable Pointer help with? We are using our IoT and AI solutions to connect into our customers' equipment, be it the exhaust, the aircon, the fridges, and we help to transform them into smart machines and unlock savings by doing data-driven and automated energy conservation. And with no need for user training, plug and play for any brands, we are really simple to get started we are able to offer to our customers a unique uh, program with savings as a service. And that's because of our focus on FMB, allowing us to tailor our innovation very specific to our customer segment. Um, and we give our customers only immediate and positive ROI. With one of our customers, we turn their equipment into smart machines and uh, Table Pointer became the first in the world to squeeze 2,400 combo meals into one PowerPoint slide. That's how precious energy savings can be because that's how many our customer has to sell to get profits equivalent to the savings that we are able to help them with. So that's a brief introduction about Table Pointer. Of course, uh, there's a lot that we are doing and I'll be very happy to share more with you in the Q&A with our content. And after this presentation, if you may see opportunities for us to be partners uh, in various ways, we will be very happy if you were to reach out to us and welcome you to join NG and us in our adventure. Thank you. Super, thanks a lot, Jason. And so, um, so as you can all see, as I said in the beginning, Jason and I know each other a little bit because um, we actually invested in, in Jason and his company. Um, but so the conversation I wanna have today is not really about table pointer, but it's more about uh, your journey in IoT. And, and, and I wanna have a bit of a, a conversation around, around um, what I think sometimes uh, is the wrong way of approaching IoT. So, so I want to start by, by giving you sort of a, a bit of a, of a thought that I have on, the, on this space and, and then essentially walk, walk you through a couple of questions and, and ideas and, 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 and at the end, uh, we'll have plenty of time to answer all the questions from the audience. So any question or any thought you have all that, that we haven't addressed, please share them and, and we'd be happy to, um, to, to address them here. But so when I talk to stakeholders in the IoT space, when I talk to IoT startup founders and so on, very, very often, I end up having conversations that are mainly focused on technology. You know, we use this kind of new sensors, we use that kind of, uh, you know, LoRa or whatever communication technology. And, 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 and essentially, what, what I personally think is that, is that it's the wrong conversation to have. Because my perspective is that IoT companies are much more like SaaS companies, software as a service companies, than they are about hardware and, and nuts and bolts and that sort of thing. And so, you know, if you talk to a founder of a, of a startup in, in any kind of SaaS uh, software solution, you generally don't hear them talk about, um, you know, which kind of uh, language they're using in their website, which kind of, uh, uh, you know, complicated infrastructure they're, they're licensing, which kind of, uh, of whether they're using Amazon or, or, or Microsoft Azure or anything of that sort. So, 
So, so, so, so what that means is that we care more in the SaaS space, which is a more mature space. We care more about the actual solution than we care about the technology. And I think in the IoT space, we still turn this around. So what I want to do with you today is explore that subject a bit and, and why I think that, that, uh, that's why we haven't seen yet what IoT companies will be able to do. So I think IoT is sort of the SaaS version too. Um, and what I'd like to do is to explore this across a couple of topics that go from customers, technology, business models, and then finally the role of, of, uh, of, of ecosystems uh, into this. So maybe just to kick us off, um, Jason, so, so you, you presented us that, you know, FMB is your customers, but can you just tell us a little bit more about who are your customers in terms of persona, if that makes sense, and how did you identify them? How did you come to the conclusion that they are your customers? Yeah, so um, our customers right now are chain operators of uh, food and beverage, restaurants and outlets. And uh, within this customer, uh, there is not just one single persona. There's a few persona from the overall general manager who is looking at the whole portfolio the, to the outlet manager, to the people who are working inside the outlets, right? The uh, rank and file chefs, uh, servers, waitresses, waiters. So with each of them, uh, our solution as an IoT touches them and touches them in a different way. It's easier to understand it from a general manager perspective where we are helping him with cost savings, improving profit margins. Um, and with the outlet manager, uh, many a times where we are thinking that we are helping them with energy savings, in fact, uh, not all of them would be measured by um, the net profits, right? They are measured by how much do they sell and what is their cost of materials when they sell it. And last but not least, the rank and file, right? Uh, many a times, if we are in their shoes, imagine, you know, those times where we were uh, secondary students in our holidays, doing part-time jobs in uh, restaurants. All you wanted to do was to go in, do your job, earn your money and get out. The last thing that you want to do is to operate this complicated system, get uh, data and uh, having to do a lot of uh, you know, yoga moves in order to get something done. So uh, as we were going through our customer journey uh, and the innovation process, we realized that uh, we, there's no one size fits all and we have to be able to uh, bring the benefit to the general manager in the way that he wants it without creating any extra uh, burden on the rest of the co company. Uh, and that is where the whole innovation stack gets built up, right? Innovation stack meaning that the deeper that you dig into the customer's problem, the more layer and layerings of your solution and your innovation that you get to build up. Um, mm. Not just on the technology, not only on the business model, but even in, in something as simple as uh, the reports that you should generate for your customers, the dashboards mm -hmm. that you should provide to your customers, all those are the layers and layers of innovation, uh, which allows you, number one, to meet the customer's problem, and number two, to create a differentiation against other competitors who are coming in who want to serve the same customer as well. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jason. And so... So, so interesting, you talk about differentiation, which I want to jump into in, in a second. But so when you start, if you, if you sort of put yourself back at the time you started Table Pointer, did, did you start this company from a technological point of view? So did you say, wow, I have this amazing piece of technology that I need to commercialize in some way? Or did you start with, with, with a customer in mind? Did you start by talking to somebody from the FMB industry and realizing they had an issue? What's, what's the, what did you do and, and what do you think others should do? If, if you've learned anything in that journey? What I've uh, really learned from the experiences is uh, whether it's for innovation, whether it's um, uh, you are a standalone entrepreneur, uh, you have to go out to fight with these two things together, right? You have to bring okay. a customer focus together with a technology and both whatever you have in your left hand as a customer focus and your right hand as a technology, they are your current best uh, solution that you have, right? mm -hmm. current best. And therefore, they are hypothesis. Uh, and when you go out there focusing on a customer with a certain technology, uh, through that interaction, you will know 
is the customer choice correct? Is the technology choice correct? And you start to get feedback points and you start to evolve from there. So both are equally important, especially in today's times where uh, many of our customers out there, they are looking for digital help, digitalization help. And when you are able to bring them a solution that is uh, loaded with technology, it helps them a lot because many of their processes may still be very manual. Right? And yet, if you are only focused on your own technology, you will be listening only to things that you want to listen instead of what the customer keeps trying to tell you. Uh, and mm. then that will not be helpful for you to evolve your innovation stack and evolve your technology as well. Right? So both are equally important. Super. Interesting what you say. So, so I generally, whenever I work with, with other companies, I generally always say start with your customer. But, but it's interesting that in your experience, you say start with your customer, but still have, still have some, some differentiating technology brick in hand and it treats, it uses the, the combination of that as a thesis, right? So that's, uh, that's interesting. So that brings me to then the, the next question, which is, is technology differentiating? So in the IoT space, do you think you differentiate yourself from others in the space because of technology? Yes, I think more and more so uh, where things are changing so fast, uh, the innovation stack is what is gonna be the differentiating part. And the innovation stack would have technology, it would have the mm -hmm. product, it would have the business model, it would mm -hmm. have the customer interactions, uh, it even has your go-to-market uh, embedded into it. And mm -hmm. all these things are coming together as you know one circle and they feed off each other. Um, and in today's world, which is changing so fast, you may think that you have a differentiating sensor and probably there's another 1,000 factories out there in China, uh, in Europe, that already has that sensor. It's just that it hasn't come to your market yet. So mm -hmm. then your differentiating point is a matter of time before it may get eroded, right? Um, but if you can stay close to the customer, stay agile in your use of technology, stay flexible in meeting their needs through the right business model, then these things together becomes really powerful to allow you to continue to solve the customer's problem and continue, continue to allow you to be different to your competitors. Okay, okay, fair enough. But so if we zoom just a little bit in on the technology question. So if you as a company have to invest in, you know, growing your sales channels, um, uh, growing your team to execute projects, or growing your development of new products, maybe going to manufacture. Um, you know, I've seen many super nice uh, uh, IoT companies that will have developed amazing hardware and software, and, and it sort of looks amazing and it's beautiful and so on. But is that is that is that is that the right thing to do, right? So if 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 you're getting you know a certain amount of money from an investor, is that the right way to spend your money to go and develop? Uh, you know, hardware and software, or in the end, is, is IoT hardware not so differentiating? And so as a result, should you not be spending most of your effort there? What's your view on that? Mm. For Table Pointer at this point in time, because of the choice of the customer that we are making on and the choice of the business model that we are doing, it makes more sense for us to be expanding ourselves by getting more customers and mm -hmm. saving as much energy as we can for them with the solution that we have. Uh, and this will come a point in time where you need to uh, improve on your efficiency, where table pointer will need to improve on this efficiency. And then the uh, decision may have to come where some of our products shall have to be in-house and proprietary, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but whether it's now or whether it's the future, something remains uh, constant, which is our understanding of the customer's problem uh, will still be the same. And because we are using IoT and AI to solve a customer's problem, there's a lot mm -hmm. of um, software and soft uh, data analysis um, algorithms that we will be building up and accumulating over time. And that's where uh, we will be able to put that into whether it's our own hardware or our uh, other sources of hardware. And there is no right or wrong. Uh, it really depends on the 
uh, assessment of the entrepreneur, looking at that point in time, you know, what's your best bet that you're going to take? Super interesting. We help you to succeed. Yeah. So, so, so that brings me to, and again, it's sort of a bit of a, of a, of a thesis I have, and I don't know if it's correct, but if you, if you look at software, right? So software has, has, grown, has grown a lot because it has become easier and easier to develop, right? Infrastructure went to the cloud as a result. It's very easy to start developing software and, and you can scale it as you grow without the need to deploy a lot of capital uh, in, in building that. Um, the same is happening in hardware, right? So we see more and more uh, the ability to have, you know, off-the-shelf components, the, the most famous ones, you know, the Raspberry Pis of this world, the Arduinos, and, and, and there's many more production versions that allow you to do similar kind of things. Um, do you think that we're evolving to, to more of a, you know, like you have the Shopify that allows you to set up a, an e-commerce in, in no time and basically focus on your e-commerce business? Do you think we're evolving into... Uh, 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 an element where, where actually the, the, the hardware of your IoT system is completely relevant or becomes completely relevant over time, but it's really more how do you combine the blocks and how do you focus on creating a value proposition that's interesting um, uh, for, for the end consumer in the end. Do you see that happening? Yeah. And, and if so, what, what, is, you know, what would you be your response to that as a company? I, I think we are seeing uh, very uh, different responses to this. And you see great companies, uh, for example, in the US, uh, Samsara, um, the IoT company focusing on the vehicles. They, they are developing their own hardware and providing their hardware to the customers. And you are also seeing, even here in Singapore, one uh, great uh, company, Trax, right, which is using uh, third-party hardware video cameras and focusing that themselves on developing the vision algorithms and uh, customer-centric uh, algorithms around the party hardware. So um, I think it is still very early for us to say which is going to be the model. And I'm also of the belief that it's so important to be staying agile. Just keep looking out for what exactly is the customer's problem? You know, what do you need in order to solve it? And if it's something that is already there, use it, right? Use it to get results for your customers so that they love you. And the more that your customers love you, the more chance that you have to be successful. Okay. 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 Interesting. Jason, I have a last question. I, I know we're almost running out of time, but um, so in, in, in this, in this idea of ecosystems, right. And, and, and with several partners and in the idea of developing something that is defensible, if it's not technology, um, what could it be? Um, what do you think about the, the thesis that, um, that, you know, you could, you could, you could develop basically your solution to be, um, you know, the Amazon uh, allowing third parties to, 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 to work uh, with your customers or, or you know, the, the likes of Shopify or, or, or many others of, of the examples that essentially do the same, right? And what they do is they, instead, of, instead of just focusing on their product, they end up evolving into a, an, an operating system, into, into a, a platform that allows, uh, that allows rich content to be created by third parties and to be uh, you know, provided to, to the end customers. Do you see Table Pointer, uh, and, and as an example, right, I mean, many other companies in other industries do the same. Do you see that happening where, you know, an IoT solution provider for a specific industry could end up being the Apple App Store for that, for that industry? If uh, Table Pointer ever has, has a chance to be mentioned in the same breath as Amazon or Shopify, you know, <laughs> uh, that will be fantastic, right? For, uh, for all of us, yeah. including the IoT industry, right? Of course. Uh, yeah. And I believe we one day will uh, have that chance to, we have the ambition, but, uh, you know, time will tell. Um, and, you know, to this question about whether should the IoT be staying focused and niche or to become a platform and to be able to enable uh, more different verticals, um, I, I think uh, really uh, it is the choice of the customer. When the customer uh, allows it and wants it, the demand is there. Solutions will be flocking to serve that demand. And uh, it is very similar to how Amazon uh, was able to sense that there are other customers out there who will need to be able to have the type of flexible bandwidth that they were using AWS for themselves. 
and they were able to then use the same capability to offer it to other customers. And before you know it, it became a platform play, right? So uh, it is just really important to continue staying close to customers and uh, hearing them and looking out for the opportunities, you know, uh, things will not stay the same. Uh, six months ago, we thought that, you know, it's just growing after growth. And uh, six months now, nobody even know where the growth is going to come from. Uh, and everything has changed all of a sudden. Will this be a one-off? Will there be more situations like COVID? Uh, none of us know. Uh, hmm. And it's only true that there will be more and more disruptions whenever everything is now closer and closer together in technology, globalization, urbanization, all these mega trends are all just pushing us to be more and more wired together. So you will expect that, yes, stay agile, stay close to the customer, stay alive, right? And be successful. All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Jason. So, um, so look, I think, I think we'll, we'll probably stop here uh, and I'd like to open up to, to the audience if there's any questions or, or thoughts or um, whatever you'd like to discuss with us. Um, Andrea, uh, will you be helping us with that? Yeah, uh, so thanks a lot for, for this uh, discussion, um, both of you. Um, do we have any questions? So please, everyone, just write down your questions in the Q&A box. So actually, I have a question, um, Jason, sure, <laughs> again, you. <laughs> um, <laughs> so how do you make sure that you, that you know like what the customer wants? before they know it themselves maybe. So do you have like, probably you have some specialized people in your company or do you some market research and so on? So what are your best practices for that? Yeah, there's uh, no substitute uh, for blood and sweat. So you have to really go down to the customer's uh, operations, spend time, um, and observe uh, what they are doing, how they are doing, um, spend time with the customers in the different layers of their people from the top to the middle to the bottom. Uh, every one of their opinion uh, counts and helps us to develop uh, the right idea. So we, we have uh, spent nights, uh, you know, all the way to 2, 3 a.m. in the morning at the customer's operations, just watching how are things happening, what's going wrong, what's going right. And mm -hmm. those are all what fits our innovation process. Okay. So there's no substitute for blood and sweat. Yeah, yeah, okay. And probably you spend a lot of time with really to like, yeah, figuring out what the customer needs before you start implementing new features, for example. Uh, and then that's the other learning, right? Uh, which is uh, move fast because if you, don't feel embarrassed by what you are providing. Uh, most of the time, you are already too slow. Uh, there will be other you know, people out there, competitors, who are already talking to your customers. So you will not be the only one. And mm -hmm. the sooner that you can release uh, new features that uh, help your customers in a better way, the faster that you should do it. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, when you do that, uh, especially in the IoT space, many of times we are dealing with uh, important equipment of our customers. It might be a car that our customer has. It might be uh, an air condition that uh, our customer has. It might be, you know, the, the office building of our customers. So those things are sensitive, right? Uh, so when I say, you know, you move fast, it is not to do it with, uh, without any concern for, you know, potential risk, but it's just, you know, continue to challenge yourself to move fast and to deliver new value to the customers and keep moving forward. You know? Okay, thank you. Um, and another question to you, Quentin. So actually before we've, um, um, before I've invited uh, you or before also Michelle, um, the idea was also to, um, to bring some new insights into this conference. So the focus of the conference is more manufacturing and how to use IoT to optimize manufacturing processes, but also slowly with the topic around like um, customer center products and how to bring back the customer needs uh, via IoT gets also more important. Um, how long have you as Angie been doing 
like or be collaborating with um, uh, ventures and and uh, would you say how from which moment on did did you feel that you getting something back from from the investments or also I think it's quite um, difficult to figure out like which um, which venture will be like successful or not. So I think it's also quite some learnings that you had in the past couple of years. Uh, it's a really it's a really interesting question, Andrea, and it's a very complicated one. So so um, <laughs> so NG NG as a group, we, we've been doing venture capital probably for the past six, seven years uh, in, in a structured manner, right? Mm -hmm. uh, NG Factory itself, which is, is here in Singapore based for Asia Pacific, has been around for two years now, almost two and a half. Um, so the, 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 the thesis that we have is, is the following, that just, just normal venture capital investment doesn't really make sense for a company, a, a big corporate like ourselves. And the reason is that it's, we, we've looked across many different companies and, and actually very few have been able to measure value that comes out of corporate venture capital investment. And the reason is simple, right? When you're a big listed company you're looking for generally a, 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 a year on year increase in, in your revenue or your bottom line or some kind of financial metric by which the, the, the market assesses your value. Startups have a very different way of, 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 of behaving, right? And, 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 and if anything, if they can grow super fast by losing money for the, for the next five years, that, that's actually okay, right? As long as they're, they're proving that they're gonna capture some, some form of value. The, so what, what we've done is essentially we, we've dissociated the two from each other. When we invest here in Asia Pacific in, in companies, and actually we often do it through venture building, which means that we're there from the very start, building the business models together with the founders, is that we, we try to set up partnerships uh, from the very start. So for example, uh, that, that, that means that one of the companies we started is one that does uh, AI analytics on satellite imagery analysis to identify the best solar sites. Right? We develop a lot of solar projects. So if they are able to help us develop new solar projects, that's amazing. Then essentially we, have, we become a customer of theirs. But they are an independent business. So we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are an investor in their business, but we don't control them. They go to the market and try to sell to anybody else. But we, with this, essentially create a unique advantage that we can leverage without, within our geographies. And we have this with all the ventures that we started. All of them have a unique way of collaborating. For example, Jason's company, Table Pointer, well, energy efficiency is one of our biggest sectors globally, right? We have probably about 100,000 people employed in the energy efficiency space across the world. Now, the FMB space is one that is very decentralized. And so for us, it's really difficult as a big organization to access that space. Um, we generally go where we can replace, you know, large cooling equipment in, into factories or in airports and that sort of things. Well, what, what Jason does is essentially it opens a new market where we couldn't be present. And now through our investments in, in, in Table Pointer, um, we can start growing our presence there. We can start providing additional services to, to some of his customers and therefore enhancing his value proposition whilst um, he takes care of something that we as an organization would have difficulties to do. So that's, that's really where, where we sit. But so we very carefully think about the design of those things. And, and, and that, that, that's a lot of constraints to deal with. So it's more than a normal VC investors. But if you do it well, um, it leads to really interesting uh, results. And, and, and I would say that the, the, the most important in this relationship is, is we first give and we then try to take. And so the idea there is to say, how can we give you access to either resources, whether they are financial, commercial, uh, customer access, and so on. And how can you then in return help us essentially go in a space where we would otherwise not be so comfortable? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think um, both of you are like uh, good examples of um, how, how it can um, yeah, be beneficial for both uh, parts to um, um, yeah, to be uh, to work in an innovative way, and should be also like encouraging for um, yeah for more hierarchical companies to take the step um, and collaborate with uh, small ventures. Definitely, yeah, yeah. No, it's a very exciting journey. Yeah. Good. So all the best, and um, thanks again for your time. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Good. So.